Is there any specific attack you're worried about? Sometimes people will kind of run up behind me and then it always flashes in my mind like, oh, what would I do if, it, if they grabbed me, yeah. Okay. So I wrote this article about giving up running in the dark over the winter. It attracted quite a lot of comments actually. I was surprised at the number of comments. Men and women, people saying that, you know, I should just go out running anyway. A lot of kind of suggestions about joining a running club or uh, taking up self-defense, joining the gym instead. It's like so good for my mental health to be able to do this. Yeah, I want to be able to do it all the time and I can't or I feel like I can't. We can talk a lot about how things should be safer and the streets should be safer, but actually the reality is they're not. This is about the human rights of women and girls to, to live, not to exist, not to uh, subsist, to live, but to thrive as well. And that's one thing that I really want to find out. Whether there's anything I can do to feel safer running at night or whether anything can be done for women to feel safer running at night. Leeds, where I live and where I grew up, has a particularly complex history with violence against women, notably with the case of the Yorkshire Ripper. For six years during the 70s and 80s, police told women to stay inside after dark while they badly mishandled the investigation and failed to catch Peter Sutcliffe, who attacked at least 22 women, killing 13. Can you predict when the Ripper might strike again? Not at all. Could be in 10 years, could be next week, could be right now. Men on the streets! Men of the streets! Last night in Leeds, public dissatisfaction with the police performance so far found a voice. Hundreds of feminists marched through the city demanding that the police should put a nine o'clock curfew on men until the Ripper is caught. That may seem a trifle bizarre, but the fact is that thousands of women are already under their own self-imposed curfew. So Leeds has got a really, really uh, long and proud history of activism, starting with the Reclaim the Night marches in uh, the 70s uh, and 80s. I was part of them in the 80s. You know, it felt so empowering, so fabulous, and I'm really proud that I'm continuing uh, that campaigning work that I've been part of for um, 50 years nearly. There was a, a lot of anger, especially among young, young women at the time, yeah. because, uh, you know, it was anybody, anywhere living in West Yorkshire could at any time uh, be a victim be a victim yeah and, yeah you know it just went on for so long and the message was very much like stay at home you know have someone with you uh, don't go out on your own and it was patronizing misogynistic you know it was power over squashing us you know minimizing us making us less than you know i want to be out i want to be out in this park i want to be on the bus there's 1.2 million women here in West Yorkshire. We know that one in five women is subject to serious sexual assault in their lives. We don't have time to, to sit back and uh, you know wait. I work alongside the Mayor Tracy Brabin. We uh, have got a safety of women and girls strategy. Uh, the Mayor's brought in £700,000 in the last year uh, for nighttime economy stuff, night marshals, taxi marshals, safe spaces. We're trying to impact every bit of the system. It's not just about policing, it's about uh, women uh, affect uh, every bit of uh, society. We want them to matter, we want them to know that they matter and we want that to be the case forever. There might be a perception now that things were going in the right direction. Be women were feeling more able to report when things had happened to them. Do you feel like with you know recent cases that we've had with Sarah Everard, we're in a position now where we could actually be going a bit backwards in terms of like public trust? Oh, absolutely. It's devastating that you know you you can't know that you're safe with the police officer. Uh, West Yorkshire is not the Met, but that doesn't mean to say we don't have our own problems. We know that. It's, it's, it's a battle. It's, uh, you know, it's shocking that we have to say this about policing, uh, but you know, we live in the real world, don't we? It feels positive that at least where I live, with a mayor and deputy mayor who are both women, feeling safe on our streets is a priority. And yet the headlines are still dominated by violence against women as we mark the second anniversary of the murder of Sarah Everard, who was killed by Wayne Cousins, a serving Met Police officer. I can't help but feel things aren't moving fast enough. Alison told me about a new app for women's safety being rolled out in Bradford, making it the world's first walk safe city. The free app is designed to make it easier to choose the safest routes through cities and towns. I'm sceptical, but I want to see if tech could be a solution to feeling more safe. 
One thing Alison Lowe was talking about was the safe places. Kind of dots on the map. The other one is a police station. So our nearest one, according to this, is the city vaults. There are certain uh, venues that have kind of signed up to this scheme to be like a safe place. If women are walking home on their own um, and they're feeling kind of a bit intimidated. <laughs> Andrew Tate. Oh, this, I read an article about uh, how young people are super into, young men are super into Andrew Tate. Um, but I'm not concerned because teenage boys have always been misogynist and he's just flavour of the month and he'll be gone soon. So the app has this kind of orange SOS button at the top. It alerts your family and friends uh, that you need help. It's a good feature in the sense that it's, it's quick and easy. So it's so much quicker than having to like, you know, message your friends. It's literally like a couple of taps, but. And I believe what she believes. Thank you, that's very kind of you. You all right though, yeah? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you. Um, yeah, so you can actually see why someone might feel uncomfortable walking around sometimes. It's like, most people are just friendly and fine, uh, but, and people sometimes just want to talk to you. Uh, but you know, it's good, it's good to have that facility. People have reported crime, so they've reported assaults um, so that you know you can see the kind of crime hotspots and you can avoid those areas. Yeah, and it seems to pull in data from uh, the local crime stats, which is useful. Ah, oh, there's a mugging. There we go. I guess it sort of does make me feel a bit safer knowing that, like, you know, there are within kind of a half a mile radius, like a couple of dozen places that I could go, you know, places that are just like, you know, literally just there. Um, another one kind of just around this corner. So, um, yeah, I, th I, guess that, I guess that would make me feel safer. Um, it's an interesting trial anyway. It's, it'd be interesting to see whether people kind of use this. That's better. Yeah. You're looking to cause as much pain and distraction as you can in a five to ten second window so that you can get out of there. Yeah. Yeah, that's your goal, getting out yeah. of there safe. Ninety-seven percent of women aged between 18 and 24 Excellent. have experienced sexual harassment, according to an investigation by the UN. The problem is not with us, but when it comes to stepping out onto a dark street tomorrow, I do want to feel safer. So I've come to see if learning Krav Maga, a martial art focused on real world situations, can help. Yeah. You're looking to do that, but you're really looking to, to be ready to strike. Okay. What you're also aware of is as I'm grabbing and turning, what happens a lot is people grab and turn and the strike's already coming. Right, okay. Okay, so. that's why the arms <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly why the arms up. It's both passive and defensive. Yeah. Okay, okay so great. now I'm gonna grab and turn. Yeah. And For me, <laughs> learning this sort of stuff, okay. having yeah. A general sense of personal safety. So you, you mentioned the streets you went down, some of them were quite suburban, some of them were quite dark. Ideally, you're just looking to avoid those kinds of places. But if you have to go down those kinds of places, hood comes down, headphones come out and you're aware. Keep that awareness. Talk, call somebody, be talking to somebody. That's always going to put, put an attacker off. If you pretend you're talking to your mum, if you get a sense that somebody's following you, start saying things like, yeah, I'm literally 30 seconds down road because that's changing the game of the person behind you. All, everything they're hearing is making them think, can I do this attack? Can this attack work? Yeah. The best we can hope for is that we get to a point where in this gym, we're training these defences, we're doing them that regularly, that in the gym, they are 90% effective. That means in a real life scenario, they'll be about 40% effective. And a 40% defence against somebody who's got no training, is gonna be very effective. Yeah. Good, and, and then, then elbow straight back. That that's it yeah. backwards yeah so like am yeah. I going for the face yeah, yeah go for face neck throat yeah yeah okay it's really easy to become risk averse yeah but being risk averse means you're probably never going to leave house in winter again yeah and we don't want that what we want to get to is a point of and you're already there to some degree risk awareness because yeah. the second you're risk aware you're, you've changed the way that you're assessing things you're starting to pay attention you're starting to understand there are risks out there but I've got a practical way to deal with it or at least a starting point Okay. It surprised me actually. I expected it to be kind of going through the motions of okay, I've done a self-defense class. 
um, yeah, look at me, I can defend myself. But actually, it definitely has made me feel a little bit more confident. We shouldn't have to do a self-defense class, but like, I don't know, if it, in the short term, if it makes you feel better, then yeah, perhaps it's worth it. I see a lot of the feedback to my article suggested I simply join a running club to feel safer. I've never run in a group before, but I've come to Chapel Allerton Runners in Leeds to see how I feel running alongside other people and to find out how common my fears are. Over the winter I kind of tend to stop running because I don't like running in the dark and I find it quite scary being out on my own. Is that a concern for anybody in the group? I would run here in the summer when it's light because I live like quite close but in the winter I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. It's certainly later at night on my own and it's something I try to avoid and something that you know, my husband doesn't like me to do either, you know. Sometimes I prefer running in the dark because you're more likely to get heckled through the day, less people can see you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was last summer where we were running very late, you know, very light until late at night and everyone just having a chat and all the women in the group started talking about being heckled and, and then every single woman said, oh yeah, that happened to me and you could see all the blokes going, oh, oh right, that's everyone, like, you know, that's just completely normal. And I just don't, and I know we, do, we, don't, we just don't have to think about it in the same way at all, you know. And when you see cases like, um, you know, obviously there's Sarah Everard, which is a, a really high profile case, and uh, Sabina Nessa, does that affect your running at all? Or? As a result of those sort of cases, the perception, your, my perception of risk changed quite a lot. And I think that's the case when running in a group. Like today, our group, several times, people sort of sarcastically clapped us on, which when you're, <laughs> <laughs> when you're in a group, it was actually quite funny. Um, but on your own, as a woman, that could really be quite threatening because every single person who did it was a lone man. I think, personally, I struggle a bit with sort of the narrative of women needing to think about this all the time because it perpetuates a, a narrative that women are victims. If you're constantly being told that it's unsafe, then you think it's unsafe, even if actually the risk is very, very small. And, I mean, I... I don't think I've ever heard of a case, certainly leads, of, of a runner being accosted, but I'm sure that people get hit by cars or you fall down and break an ankle or things like that. The risk of those things is much, much greater than the risk of being attacked. So to me, if I was taking my phone with me, it's more because I'm worried that I might fall down and might need somebody to come pick me up, you know. When I wrote the piece, a few people, a few women just said, you know, I, I, I don't care, I do it anyway, and I was like, do it anyway. <laughs> That's an option. I, I find it really sad to think that so many women don't do things because they are afraid or feel at risk. You you are stopping yourself from experiencing things that actually the the, the, the reward massively outweighs the risk of, of doing them. I am newly compelled by the argument that we can't put our lives on hold over the winter through fear. And as the evenings get lighter again and we regain a sense of freedom, it's a discussion that's starting to feel as though it can wait. But it won't be long before winter rolls around again and again, and we should not be left facing these same fears year after year.